And I'd like to invite Jean Cook up to talk a bit more about artist revenue streams. I'm just curious, how many of you uh, knew about the quizzes before this morning? Did you take it? How'd you do? Mm, okay. Um, well, I have a presentation here. Um, okay, that's working great. My name is Jean Cook. Um, I'm the Director of Programs for Future of Music Coalition, and I'm the co-director of the Artist Revenue Streams Project, which Kristen mentioned. It's a research initiative that's gathered the broadest and most detailed existing data set about U.S. musician income. So this data set is, um, we've been collecting it over the last few years. It includes 81 in-depth personal interviews with artists, six anonymous financial case studies, and then answers, uh, 5,300 musicians took the money from music survey. So what that's meant is that over the last few years, our team uh, of three has been literally, or not literally, figuratively, I guess, drowning in data. Because how that actually translates, those 81 interviews actually means hundreds of pages of interview transcripts. And those financial case studies means thousands of pages of financial records from individual artists. And with 5,300 people taking, in some cases, a 110 question quiz, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of data points that we've been kind of sorting through over the last few years. Um, so to date, we've published more than 20 data memos at music, uh, sorry, at money.futureofmusic.org. Today's presentation is a sneak preview on our forthcoming report about the value of music. So I'm gonna review some qualitative but mostly quantitative data that addresses four main points. The first bucket of um, what I'm gonna present to you is, is talking about the conflation of value and money. The second thing I want to talk about is um, I'm going to review some data about the experiences of those musicians who feel that their work has been devalued. The third uh, section is going to take a look at copyright's impact on income for musicians by role and also by genre. And then finally, we're also going to take a look at how gross numbers, focusing on gross numbers, can distort value um, using some examples from our data as well. So first we're gonna look at the conflation of value and money. So how do you measure value? So in the music business, it's common to encounter arguments about the value of music where the arguments are focused on money. Uh, how much is a Spotify stream worth, for example? Or how much did that tour gross? So we also hear value described in the context of having a lot of fans or press or eyeballs being monetized. Uh, critics and artists might talk about the artistic value or influence of a particular record or song. Uh, being able to attract sponsors or labels who can invest in you because of your strong brand. Offering something that no one else has, has value. In our interviews, when we asked people to talk about value, they described all of these things and a lot more. So there are two basic takeaways from this first piece. First, we recognize the limitations of talking about the value of music through the narrow lens of money, especially when you're trying to understand how value shifts during disruptive technological transitions. You're only looking at one part of a large and really complex picture. But if you are gonna focus on money, especially in reference to what's good for the artist, and this is the second takeaway, it's important to understand the distinction between the money that's generated throughout the industry by an artist's work and the money that actually ends up in the artist's bank account. So we have an illustration. The money that gets generated throughout the industry for an artist's work, this is kind of how I think about it in my head. And then the money that actually ends up in the musician's bank account. Okay, um, so that's the first section, very brief. Um, the second section is going to take a look at some data and uh, this is gonna get a little bit deeper. Uh, this is the experiences of uh, musicians who feel that their work has been devalued. 
Towards the end of the survey, we asked respondents to rate how strongly they agreed or disagreed with statements about how emerging technologies impacted their careers, with over 4,500 people uh, answering that question. So 1,297, or 28% of the respondents, agreed or strongly agreed with the statement, my music has been devalued. The next few slides are going to compare the pool of people, people who agreed with that statement that their music had been devalued with those who did not agree. To help you through this section, uh, let's call those who agree that their music has been devalued Sad Sam. And uh, those who disagree that their music has been devalued, let's call them Happy Harry. So first, let's look at the difference between Sam and Harry's revenue pies. So the one on the left, Again, is people who agree that their music has been devalued. Those are the sad Sams. And on the right, the pool of us, oh, uh, sorry. And on the right, we've got the happy Harrys. So those are the people who disagree that their music has been devalued. So the pool of respondents, so the sad Sams, they're earning on average about $37,653 in gross estimated music income. Happy Harrys are about earning about $4,500 less on average, $33,000. Because not all musicians are working full time, we also looked at the hourly wage for both groups just to see what the difference was so we could get a better comparison. Sad Sam's are grossing about $27 an hour and Happy Harry's are grossing about 23. When you look at the actual revenue pies, you see that both types of musicians are earning roughly the same share of revenue for most categories with three exceptions. Sad Sams are earning a larger share of their income from compositions and recordings. That's the uh, red and the orange wedges. Um, that's about 4% and 3% respectively. So going the other way, Happy Harrys are earning a larger share of their income from teaching, about 5% more. So. Just to summarize, so the average Happy Harry's music income and hourly rate is less than a Sad Sam. And Sad Sams are earning more from composing and recording income streams than Happy Harry's. And then Happy Harry's are earning more from teaching. Now the second one is kind of interesting because they're earning more from composing and recording income streams in terms of their revenue share, but also overall considering that their income is higher than the Happy Harry's. So, um, is everybody, is this all making sense so far? Okay, cool. Um, so the gray slice in this pie, that's the other category. So that's made up of many other revenue streams, including the 13 on this slide. This chart measures how many respondents participated in these other revenue streams. This is not a measurement of the amount of income from these streams, it's just how many people said yes, I participate in this revenue stream. So sad Sam's, are more likely to earn income from all of these streams uh, than Happy Harry's. So in some cases, a lot more. In some cases, just a little bit more. Um, we didn't show you all of them because they wouldn't fit in one chart. There are about 23 streams. Uh, sorry, there are 20 streams in the other category. The only revenue streams where Happy Harry's were more likely to participate in that income, in that revenue stream, uh, was uh, grants. So. Uh, so just to review this last chart that we just saw, it was the gray sliver of the revenue pies of the other category. Sad Sam's are more likely to be earning nearly all of the other revenue streams than Happy Harry's. The only place where Happy Harry's are more likely to be earning money in the other revenue category is grants. So um, this next chart takes a look at perceived changes in income by both groups. So here we've got seven categories of income. We've got session work, recording, live performance, salary from an orchestra or band, merchandise, et cetera. The first line of each category looks at Happy Harry's. The second, si <laughs> the second uh, line of each category looks at Sad Sam's. The question we asked was, has each revenue stream increased, decreased, or stayed the same? And the two things that I want, there are two things that I want to point out about this chart. The first one I want to point out is the gray bars. Yeah, you can still see them, great. Um, the size of these bars gives you a sense of how many respondents participate in each of these streams. So for example, 69% of Sad Sam's participated in session work as a revenue stream, compared to 60% of Happy Harry's. 
68% of SAD SAMs participated in recording income as a revenue stream compared to 52% of Happy Harry's, and so on. So the first takeaway is this. SAD SAMs are more likely to participate in all of these revenue streams, with the exception of teaching and salary. The second point is that SAD SAMs are clearly perceiving their gains to be less great and their losses to be worse than Happy Harry's. As an example here, we've got 21% more of SAD SAMs reporting a decrease in their session work than reporting increases. This compares to 3% for Happy Harry's. For recording revenue, 17% more of SAD SAMs reported a decrease in their session work revenue stream than reported increases. This compares to 1% for Happy Harry's. Where there's a net gain reported for live music for Happy Harry's, there's a significant net loss for Sad Sam's. So what we're seeing is that there's a large perception gap between how the revenue is flowing between the Sad Sam's and the Happy Harry's. And across the board, the perceived losses over the last five years are worse, and the gains are smaller for the Sad Sam's. OK, so the final chart on the Sad Sam's and the Happy Harry's looks at the differences by genre and by role. Here we have four categories of artists with no overlaps in between them. Classical musicians, jazz musicians, those who identify their primary genre as composer. Yes, you heard me right. When we asked people what their genre was, we gave it an option for people to say that they were composers, implying that they worked in many different genres. And we have 206 people who insisted that the composer was their genre. And then we also had everybody else in the, in the last category where 1,970 people sit. So here you can see the classical musicians are less likely to be sad Sams, with only 21% agreeing that their music has been devalued. On the other end of the scale, composers are the most likely of the four groups to be sad Sams, with 37% agreeing that their music has been devalued. Jazz musicians and other genres were in between, with 32% agreeing. So what else can we tell you about sad Sams and happy Harrys? Sad Sams have more years of experience than Happy Harry's, but they're not necessarily older. Sad Sams have more releases, and they've, uh, and they've written more songs. They participate in more union-related income streams, but are not more likely to be members of the union. Sad Sams are more likely than Happy Harry's to be highly comfortable using technology to promote and distribute their music. And they're slightly more likely to be male but not that much more, uh, that was a joke. Um, Los Angeles-based musicians are more likely to be Sad Sams than musicians from Nashville, New York, Chicago, Austin, San Francisco, or any other location. In short, Sad Sams appear to be, on the face of it, and by many different measures, more successful than Happy Harry's, and they're more likely to believe that their music has been devalued. So we're now gonna leave the world of Sad Sam and Happy Harry. I'm not gonna do any more with them for the moment. We're going to look at the third section, which takes a look at copyright's impact on musicians by role and by genre. It's two charts. For the first chart, um, we divided the seven categories of music income into three buckets. So when you look at directly related to copyright under songwriting and composing, this includes, it, this includes publisher advances, mechanical royalties, PRO royalties, commissions, sync licensing, ringtone licensing, and sheet music sales. Sound recording includes sales of physical or digital recordings, uh, which includes uh, both retail and sales at shows. Uh, it includes payments from interactive services like Rhapsody or Spotify. Sound exchange royalties, master use licensing or for syncs, um, or also for ringtones. On the other side, we've got Indirect and unrelated, that's touring, shows, live performance fees, teaching, salary as an employee of a symphony or band or ensemble as a performing employee, um, or merchandise. And then in between, we've got uh, session musician earnings. This is called a mixed relationship uh, because it includes both payment for work in the recording studio, which would be have a closer relationship to copyright, and also for live performances, which has a less direct relationship. So we're going to look at the distribution of these buckets by jazz, classical, composer, and other. So here you can see that 14% of income for classical musicians had a direct relationship or a mixed relationship to copyright. 
17% of jazz income has a direct or mixed relationship. Over half of composer's income has a direct or mixed relationship to copyright. For other genres, the number is 27%. Um, this, check this second chart is kind of a fun one that I thought I'd try out. Um, it's, estimated, it's the estimated aggregate dollar value of each revenue category. So what does that mean? Each respondent told us what their gross income was from all sources. And then what percentage of their revenue came from music. Then they told us how that music revenue was broken down among these eight buckets. We added up all of the money in each bucket for over 5,000 respondents, and that gives us this chart here, which is in millions of dollars. So nearly $173 million um, in gross music-related revenue was earned by our sample. Of that total, using the categories that we defined earlier, about $24 million of revenue was earned uh, that had a direct relationship to copyright. $20 million was mixed, and $129 million uh, was earned that had an indirect or unrelated relationship to copyright. So the two takeaways from this section are pretty simple. The amount of income that you derive from copyright depends on your genre and whether or not you're a composer. Uh, a little less than a quarter of the income reported to us in the Money from Music survey had a direct or mixed relationship to copyright. And um, the importance of that really goes up when you consider that this is all income before expenses. So the importance of the copyright income as well uh, can change once you understand the difference between net and gross. And that's actually what this last point of this presentation is going to be. So um, this last section is a really important one, and it's about how relying on gross numbers can distort value. Basically, it's about the difference between net and gross. All of the charts that you've seen so far have been reports of gross earnings before expenses, and that's because it's really complicated to try and collect expense information in a broad survey, uh, like the Money for Music survey, in any kind of accurate or consistent way. So for this section, we're actually going to analyze the data that's um, collected in the case studies, where we had access to detailed expense uh, and income information. So here's the first example. So this is a jazz band leader. This chart notes his income above the middle line and his expenses below the middle line. The silver line that runs through all of the con columns indicates the net, or the difference between income and expenses from year to year. Because we're able to um, work with very detailed expense information, remember the thousands of pages of financial reports? Those are real. Um, Kristen and I had to look at all of them. Uh, <laughs> it's true. Um, we're able to match certain expenses to income. So for example, plane tickets are paying sidemen for a tour can be subtracted out of the tour receipts. Merchandise costs can be taken out of the gross merchandise income. So here is the ba jazz band leader's income after expenses for the entire period of 2006 to 2011. As you can see, he took home about 28% of his gross income overall. And when you look at the specific revenue categories, net versus gross, he took, about, took home about 21% of his touring income. 19% of his grant income, and 31% of his recording income. You can read more about his story in our case study reports at money.futureofmusic.org. So this is a jazz band leader. The second example is the indie rock composer performer. So here again, you have his income and expenses from 2008 to 2011. The income's above the line, expenses are below the line, and the silver line indicates the net income from year to year. So um, he earns money both as a salaried member of a popular band, which is showed in light blue on this page, and also as a solo leader of his own ensemble, which is shown in darker blue and labeled live. Here's the artist's income after expenses for the entire period of 2008 to 2011. He took, up, he took home about 55% of his gross income. Looking at the specific revenue categories, net versus gross, his tours and recordings lost money. He took home about 69% of his merchandising money after expenses. And basically, understanding that, when you look at this chart again, you see that 
In the first three years shown on this chart, his work as a salaried member of the band effectively subsidized his solo career. More about this case study can also be found at money.futuredmusic.org. The third and the last example from our case studies is a chamber music group. So you can see their income and expenses uh, from the years 2002 to 2010. Again, income is above the line, expenses are below the line, and the net line that goes through indicates income minus expenses. Unlike the previous two examples, this group's income is almost entirely made up of live performance fees. After expenses, they take home about 49% of their income. And looking at specific revenue categories, net versus gross, they take home about 50% of their touring money and about 37% of their profits from sales of CDs on the road. I have other examples, but we're short on time. They're all at money.futureofmusic.org. Um, but the basic takeaways from this section are that live performance and recording income, as well as merchandise and grants, they very often have significant expenses attached to them. Some of the less expense-influenced inf streams include salary, session, and composition money. For many as well, teaching can also be a stable source of income. So those are the four sections of this presentation. It's, again, a sneak preview of some of the analysis that we're going to be presenting in our next data menu, data memo, which is called The Value of Music, and that's going to be published again at money.futureofmusic.org in the coming months. So um, feel free to grab me if you want to discuss what you saw or if you have questions or concerns. We're very interested in getting feedback before we publish. I'm going to leave you with um, a quote from the qualitative piece um, from one of our interviewees. And then also here is my email address where we can't connect. And I think, do we have time to take a couple of questions? Um, I think we do have a little bit of time. So if anybody wants to ask some questions, I can take them now. Yes. Can you come up to the mic, please? Because we're webcasting this, uh, we want to make sure that people are able to hear your question. I was really just going to ask if you could show that slide again with the different streams of in income. Do you remember that one with where you said teaching was like 41.4 million and Oh yeah, sure. Okay, thanks. So this is the aggregate dollar value of the money earned by the people who took the survey, the money from music survey. So that's just um this is just 5,000 people that 5,000 people's revenue divided into buckets and all added up. Is there another question? Yeah, do you mind coming down to the mic? Oh, and I also wanted to say special thanks to Erin McKeown for letting me use her picture in my presentation. Hi. From the opposite world of the arts, and I've been addressing copyright, unauthorized threat theft, and piracy. What I'm hearing from you is something I recently came to the understanding of. Sad Sam and Happy Harry are maybe the difference between a real working artist and someone who dabbles in it, and it may be a future. So as, as I've been addressing the two-dimensional arts world of copyrights, I'm finding that people who have a job and aren't worried about this being their income, have a different regard to even understanding copyright, the value of it, and their attitudes greatly um, disrupts the value of the professional artist. And I think this is the same for every industry. And one of the points I keep on making is that we have to look at copyright as a whole. It's one wheel and multiple models. So the issue of music copyright is no different than the issue of photography copyright or arts copyright or writing copyright. We need to understand there are the professionals. There are the people that start out that are learning. And then they're the ones that more often disrupt our value as it's perceived and reported in reports to Congress. So that's a little bit of the feedback I've been getting. Because I'll talk to people about a copyright, they'll say, my goodness, you're so passionate about it. I've been doing it since I'm 19. And they're, what they're doing, they're not understanding our value, greatly hurts the integrity of my work and the work of the professional mus musicians here, too. Thank you very much.
I was curious, for those of you who saw the sad Sam and the happy Harry presentation, for how many of you, like, was this kind of, you already knew about this, this all kind of reinforces your experiences in the music world? Huh, okay. And for how many of you was it kind of a surprise? Oh, interesting. So after having looked at that and thought about it, would you say that you know some sad Sams? Are a lot of sad Sams here? Thanks. That's really interesting. Was everybody able to hear him? No? Okay, so I'll just paraphrase, um, which is that because sad Sams don't have the same kind of stability that happy Harrys do because they teach less, uh, it's a very up and down kind of income model, and it's a freelance model, and it's one where they feel that their work has been devalued partially because it's just constantly going up and down and also they just, it's very unpredictable. Does that sound about? Yes. Okay. Um, I am kind of curious about the people in, in the room uh, because there are so many who seem to kind of, uh, the sad Sam thing resonates. Um, are there other ideas or theories or thoughts about why they may feel that their music is devalued? And if so, do you mind coming up to the microphone so everybody can hear? Well, you already spoke, so let's let her go first. Yeah. Right. If I ask one question on methodology before answering, sure. um, is that was there any measure as to um, try to ascertain the reliability of the self-reported data? As a as an indie musician, I could imagine in moments of frustration, like overstating hours and understating income, not be, not at a willful deception, but because so few. Musicians maybe really log in like, yeah, I'm at the piano for an hour and a half, you know, mm -hmm. and keep records like that. That's a really important question. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, so as I mentioned, um, this is the most kind of thorough and largest data set about musicians, which actually isn't, I mean, it's impressive, but it's actually kind of not impressive. It's just that there's no data about musicians that are out there. Um, we have been able to take a look at the comparisons between our data set and then also some rand randomly selected data, so, people, uh, so a population that isn't uh, self-selected, and that would be from the census. Um, again, the census has its own problems, but you know, self-selection is, is not as bad for that as it is for our data set. And in that uh, data set, We've taken a look at, um, we've done spot checks on different cities. We've taken a look at um, the average income for people who reported their income as music. We looked at the demographic differences, male versus female, and um, age, and then we've also looked at um, race as well. And, um, you know, there's not a whole lot you can do with that because it doesn't go into genre, it doesn't go into people with multiple jobs, independent contractors are considered kind of separately, so it's, um, it's an imperfect comparison, but, when we did take a look at that, I mean, for what that's worth, um, we did find that we we're actually not that far off. So, uh, red dress. Nice dress, by the way. Thank you. Uh, I guess my, uh, it's a comment and a question. I guess I would be in the happy Harry situation because I'm an attorney, but uh, making money off of entertainment has been uh, relatively new for me. And uh, from, the feedback I'm getting from various clients, it seems like the younger clients do tend to be um, more optimistic, but like you said, it's the one who have been doing it for much longer uh, have come across less optimistic. And I'm just wondering if the difference could be not necessarily they think it's, 
I'm wondering if the difference could be the perception of, of what's devalued is it could be twofold. It could be one, like I think about the older producers and they get away with uh, less control or they, they, they now don't get away with as much control as they used to, let's put it that way, where they would have more percentages or more rights or, or like you said, direct copyright ownership, which people don't give up as willingly uh, anymore. And then the second would be for the younger artists, um, uh, like the gentleman said earlier, being more independent and in releasing music on their own or independent of what they had contracted with, with say a record label or something like that. And um, therefore kind of diversifying the re revenue streams away from that controlled environment. Does that make sense? <laughs> the question, I mean? I think so. I mean, what you're saying kind of resonates a little bit with me because in the interviews that we conducted, so we conducted over 81 interviews and these were like hour long interviews where you sat down and you talked to people. And for, for most of them, we asked them the question about the value of music. And when people talked about value, as I mentioned in the first section, of this presentation, they're not just talking about money. And sometimes they are, in some cases, they are talking about things like control. Um, and that sometimes that's almost as important or just as important in some ways. And for them, that that's kind of an indicator of value. Tim? Yeah. Oh, you're next. Sorry. I was actually going to kind of raise that same point. Um, the You didn't present it to us, but I'm wondering whether you took uh, data of how much, how many shows people are playing and how many sales and albums they're doing and how that compares. Because they might be selling more music but making less of it even though comparatively between Happy Harry and Sad Sam, Sad Sam's making more money, they just might be making less per each than they used to. I think we know how many shows they did. Um, and, I, and we know how many how many records they've made and how many songs they've done, but I don't know if we know how many records they sold. Um, but what I can tell you is that the Sad Sams have written more songs and they have made more recordings than the Happy Harrys. And I'll have to take a look at the tour ones because I, I don't remember if I took a look at that, but I wouldn't be surprised if they toured more as, as, as well because their touring income tended to be higher. So that was my take on that. Yeah. Tim? The thing that surprised me from the charts was actually how little, how small the difference in average income between the Happy Harrys and the Sad Sams was, um, and which I think actually belies the notion that, oh, if you're not sad, you're just a hobbyist. I think public service announcement, beware of people who say things like that. I, I really doubt them. Um, but since averages can, can lie, uh, and you're closer to all this data, is that how precipitous is the drop for the Sad Sams compared to the Happy Harrys, in your, based on what you've seen? It's weird because they're kind of similar in so many ways, um, but then there are these tiny differences which I think are kind of telling. Um, we are able to look at the income spread, not just the, not just the average, and that you know, you're seeing it's, it's fairly close in most of the categories. You just have a little bit more of the Sad Sams in the higher higher numbers, and then when it comes to the lower numbers, just a little bit less. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you had any data on uh, shared revenue, like uh, for a sound recording. Um, if an artist makes a sound recording, they might have to share the, the total revenue of that recording with other people, like a record label, or they might feel that they're uh, not getting the full value of that recording, or other aspects of their income, they might have to share that with somebody. And that might explain a, a sad Sam if they might be making more money, but less of the value of the thing they created goes back to them. Mm -hmm. um, the shared thing and the not shared thing, um, because there are so many ways that people think about their income, some people might think about their income in terms of what did my band make in the last year. So others might think about what did I actually make, could I make my rent? in the last year, and so what we've chosen to do with the design of the survey um, was that uh, we asked people how much money ended up in their bank accounts. So not necessarily kind of from a shared perspective, but just what ended up in their bank account. And that was something that we were able to kind of do consistently so that way we could compare people. In the interviews, that, that said in the interviews, people were given a lot more leeway and they were able to talk about kind of arrangements and, and things with other folks as well. So we were able to get a little bit of data about that. I think, or do we have to wrap up or do we have time for one more? 
Okay, we have time for one more. So you're the lucky guy. Hi. Hi. Um, I have actually two quick two questions, but the first one's a real quickie. Um, in your chart on indie rock musician, um, you had knowledge of craft as a revenue stream. What mm -hmm. is that? That was teaching. Okay. And how come it's, is that, did you use the same term for other people? Uh, for other people, it was all kind of slightly different. It's always purple across all of the things. Um, so knowledge of craft is a bucket that includes teaching. Um, and then for other people, let me see, when you looked at these guys, they also had the purple, which was teaching. Um, but because it's a larger bucket, it also includes other things. Um, I'll, I would have to look and see what the exact things were in it. That's it may okay. have included more than just teaching. It's okay. The, the, the more important question I had was, do you have a breakout of respondents by genre of music? Uh, we have a report. We have data memos. We've got 20 of them. One of them is about jazz musicians, so it looks at just the jazz musicians. No, but I mean, of these results that you're showing with the Sad Sams and the Happy Harrys, mm -hmm. um, what percentage of your respondent pool was was each genre, sure. uh, roughly. That one. Uh, you can see we've got it by jazz, classical, other, other, and then composer. The ends are the total number of respondents, regardless of whether they said yes or no. My music has been okay. All right, thank you. Sure. So thanks for the feedback. Uh, please feel free again to grab me if you would like to talk about this data some more. And please do look for the report when it comes out in the next couple of months at money.futureofmusic.org. Thank you so much. We have a five-minute break before our conversation about copyright that will start in five minutes. Thanks.